Uh, Professor, convicting a mother of involuntary manslaughter, this was a test case and it has resulted in a guilty verdict. Yeah, it's really quite remarkable. It's really that the facts of this case were so uh, damning. They were so difficult. They were so hard for us all to hear. But even though we knew that these were really difficult facts where a mother had bought her son the gun, she had known that he was researching ammunition, she had joked with him about it. Um, indeed, she'd even been called to the school the very day of the shooting and asked if she wanted to take her son home and left without telling the school officials that he had a gun on him. So these were difficult, difficult facts. And my colleagues and I all thought it could go either way. Even then, when the verdict actually came out, you couldn't help but to be surprised that the basic legal principle that you're not responsible for others was just pushed too far here. What ramifications do you think this will have? You know, the law lives on precedent. And so while there's a kind of, again, bedrock principle that we teach all law students at the very beginning, now you've given prosecutors a new tool, a tool that they're going to be able to say, look, if the case is uh, calls enough, if the case pushes us enough, we will go to trial for this. And that means certainly, for example, for her husband, he's now facing a real uphill battle. It'll be a different jury, but he certainly can understand the kind of danger he's in. But for many other parents, there's going to be a worry that even in cases less extraordinary, uh, the parent who's trying to keep their son out of trouble, out of maybe gang behavior, maybe struggling with drugs and alcohol and goes for a joyride. The question is, where exactly will the law draw the line? And what ambitious prosecutor will tell them, if you don't agree to a plea bargain, mm. I will track this case and send you to prison for much longer? Now, as you say, this was described as a test case, but has there been a general push to hold parents responsible? Have there been uh, lesser charges and convictions on this front? We have seen some cases where parents are held responsible for their direct negligence, but it is quite a different step to hold parents responsible, not for their negligence, but for what their son does or for what their child does. So that's really a, 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 a you know, one might say a more extraordinary step forward. There have been some smaller cases where the parents have pled guilty, and so those cases don't attract nearly as much attention. Um, and frankly, in our past, we've had moments where parents have been held liable, for example, for their children not coming to school. But those experiments typically disappeared under the weight of social pressure, under the weight of community pressure, and under the concern that they were often applied in racialized ways, harming Black families at a much higher rate. Now, this was contentious, that's clear to see, but that was even seen within the prosecutor's office, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, these kind of cases where the law moves means that we are, in some real sense, going against our legal instincts. Um, on the one hand, as I said, the facts are hard enough that I, I, I understand why a prosecutor would want to try it. I mean, you know, I have children too, and it's, it's terrifying when we drop them off to school, we think they're safe. On the other hand, there's this kind of moral intuition that at some point you can't be responsible for somebody else's behavior. And I think both in society, but also in a prosecutor's office, um, people are going to be really torn about that. Even my friends and colleagues and I had robust arguments about which way this case would go. Do you think the case gives any more clear an answer as to at what point a child's behavior is your responsibility and at what point it no longer is? Yeah, I think these are going to be difficult lines to draw, right? One easy and clear line would have always been when the child hits the age of majority, when they're 18. But of course, you know, again, the law lives by analogy. And our, our hunger to punish has meant that we are increasingly punishing younger and younger people. So if not 18, if 18, why not 17? If 17, why not 16? In this case, Crumley was 15 when he conducted the shootings. And so as with all things legal, we'll see prosecutors push it ever one step more. Professor Yanka, you mentioned concerns along racial lines a moment ago. Is that a concern for the future as well? Look, in America, whenever there is um, an amping up of criminal law, it almost certainly ends up aiming at the most vulnerable, politically vulnerable, the poor, and in America, almost certainly the black and the brown. Um, and my fear is, to the extent this can have a racial impact, it'll be in less spectacular cases. It'll be in a case where somebody's child is misbehaving. They can't quite control their child. The child does something awful. But instead of being national news, it'll be a quiet plea bargain because a mother will know that she's 
you know, completed three years or is facing 15 years here. Um, and those kind of low level kind of cases um, are the grist of the criminal law that consumes so, so, so many people of color in America. 